Hello, everyone. It's a delight to welcome you to Children Need Art. This is the first of five talks prior to next year's summit, which will be staged here in Copenhagen. The interview that I'm about to undertake now takes place at the Swedish Embassy. Don't be confused. The Swedish Embassy is right round the corner from the Royal Playhouse, which is where next year's major summit is going to be staged. Our first guest today is none other than Lord David Putnam. Hello. Lord Putnam or David? I prefer David, it's what my parents call me. Right, okay, so I'll call you David. Thank you very much for joining us, David. You're joining us from um, Skipperine, West Cork, Ireland, which is where you're currently residing. I'm sure a lot of people, when we talk about education, know about you, uh, but still, you made your name in the film industry. You have loads of, uh, I think we can see some of the trophies behind you. You have BAFTAs, uh, Oscar awards, um, um, what not. I mean, when you look, at, when I look into your CV, it's um, you've won everything. You've been the father behind such films as The Mission, The Killing Fields, Chariots of Fire, Boxy Malone, and my own personal favorite, That'll Be the Day from 1973. So you've made a household name for yourself in the film industry, and you are a member of the House of Lords, hence your title, your lordship, uh, and you've made various other things. But in the last 25, 30 years, you've been very um, engaged in the world of education. Uh, and I loved it. I really, really loved it. I spent two years touring around Britain. I saw more of Britain those two years than ever before in my life. Uh, talking to teachers, going to staff rooms, finding out how they saw the world, how they felt that the world saw them. And I started a whole lot of things I'm incredibly proud of. I started our National Teaching Awards, which still 22 years later still goes on. Um, I think I, I'd like to think, I injected confidence and dignity into a profession which people had not regarded properly for a long, long time. Now, interestingly enough, during lockdown, people had to think again about the, the role and the importance of teachers, because in a sense, the centrality of teachers and, and, the, and the issue of childcare and, and education had become very, very big in all of our lives. But that just wasn't the case in the mid 90s. Uh, basically, I say teachers were leaving the, the, the profession in droves and I was asked to come in and try and do something about it. When you went to school in the 1950s, um, I mean, are you sort of trying to redress some of the imbalances that you felt yourself when you were an undergraduate? Yes. I, uh, I, to be absolutely honest, I hated secondary school. No kid ever turned up. I passed my um, the, uh, initial exam at, uh, at 11 or 10, actually. Uh, and I went to school, to grammar school full of enthusiasm. You know, every pencil sharpened a new, new pencil box and my blazer and my badge. And within two terms, I became utterly disillusioned because I've been taught by people who, and in fairness to them, there was a generation of people who come out of the war, there weren't any jobs, and they'd gone into teaching. And they didn't really want to be in teaching, but they were in teaching. And my bad luck, in a sense, is that that's who I was confronted with. With one unbelievable exception, a woman called Miss Kirkpatrick, my history teacher. And she gave me a love of history, which has sustained me all my life, really. Uh, but the other teachers were, it's unfair to say they were useless. They were probably all right in their own terms, but they, they, I didn't want to know about school. I fled school at 16, literally. But what I'd fled was a, a knowledge that, you know, I'd been, they in a way decided that I was never going to make it to university. Therefore, because I wasn't going to get to university, I wasn't worth bothering with. And that struck me at the time as being not very smart. Who, who said you were not worth bothering with? They used to use this horrible phrase, university material. And in those days, only 6% of kids got to university in Britain. Only 6%. Uh, and most of those were from private schools, frankly. So, um, you know, you were fodder. And basically you were being, you know, hopefully you might get in a job as a, in, in, in a behind a till in a bank if that was the kind of top end of your aspiration. In my case, the careers master actually said to me, well, you could always go and be a rep. I said, well, what's a rep? He said, well, a rep's a guy who goes around the country getting orders for goods and things like that. And I said, I don't think that's what I want to do. And he actually said this to me. He said, Sonny, it's the only way you'll ever have a car. That's what I left school with. You've proved him wrong several times, I should say. <laughs> well, the weird thing is, if I was in my office right now, I've got, I've got a ledge and I've got a 
I've got a model, little small model of every car I've ever owned in my life. I think there are 16 different models. So obviously it really, it really got to me because I've even bothered to have a model of every car I've ever bought in my life. <laughs> <laughs> David, I, I was thinking, when you went to school, and that's why I'm staying with your experience back then in the 1950s, when you went to school, how much emphasis was placed on teaching you the creative subjects, uh, the arts? None. None. Uh, we had a we had a kind of separate part of the school that was called the art room, and uh, for I think it was two terms a week you went to the art room, but you're left alone. I mean, basically uh, you could kind of mess around. Now, the interesting thing happened to me was that they gave had a competition at school for a poster for a brand new thing called UNICEF. There's an amazing, it's an extraordinary coincidence. Um, I wasn't, I I couldn't draw anything, but I did a very graphic poster making a going around what was then in those days a large penny so i did the penny for a head and i made the head a globe and i can't remember what i did with the rest of it but anyway i created this poster and the only two things i ever won at school were my 25 yards swimming certificate and a 10 shilling book voucher for um for, for my poster so when i left school i thought of, oh maybe if i've got to get a message to be a messenger somewhere maybe i'll try and be a messenger in an advertising agency and at first I couldn't, but my second job is I did manage to become a messenger at an advertising agency. And that's really that was the beginning of my life. And you also later on gone, got to work with UNICEF, didn't you? Yeah, and then the later I was president of UNICEF. I mean, who could, he couldn't make it up, could you really? <laughs> it sounds like it's taken from a film script. Um, but, but David, my reason for asking these questions is that, well, you are a lord, meaning you are uh, in the house of... Of, of the Lords, you are a well-known figure, but you're also, in a sense, a, a witness to history, uh, and, and you've seen a certain development. So my question is, do you, do you think that teaching the arts is today an essential element in strengthening our democratic institutions, our democratic values? Because um, I'm sure most of those people who watch this will agree that certain of those values and institutions have come under fire in recent years. Well, certainly, I can, I can only really speak to the, the UK. I live here in Ireland, where actually the, at the local and regional attitude of the arts is quite strong because we have local regional music, dance. Uh, it's, it's taken quite seriously where, where I live. But I think in the UK, certainly in the education sector, it's, it's a sort of nice to have. It's not taken very seriously at all. In fact, uh, if anything, in the last 10, 20 years, it's, uh, the, it's, it's got worse. It is not now a necessary part of the curriculum. You can go right the way through school without doing any art subjects whatsoever. And yet, here's the one, one extraordinary irony, uh, up until the lockdown, the creative industries in the UK had become 8% of the entire economy, the, 8% of GDP in, in Britain. That's to say it was larger than financial services. It was larger than the, uh, the energy industry. Uh, so weirdly, this, this neglected subject had reared its head and become an enormously important part of the of the economy of the UK. Now you would have thought someone might have woken up and realised that, but I'm afraid they didn't. And they specifically didn't over the Brexit negotiations, where once again the creative industries have been left to uh, really flounder. But but David, when you talk to your peers, say in the House of Lords, when you talk to lawmakers, when you talk to intellectuals, um, what do you think? Why do you think it is like that? What you just described? Why, why do you think that the arts are being looked as if it's sort of the icing on the cake, something luxurious, perhaps even uh, superfluous? Uh, why do you think it's looked upon in that way? I don't know. I really don't know. When we originally did what was called a mapping document of the contribution of the arts to the economy, there was a significant surprise because it turned out to be just under three percent. This was in 1998. And people were amazed it was 3%. Now, what's really interesting is the arts-based component of the UK economy has since then grown at twice the speed, twice the speed of any other element of the economy, twice the speed. And yet still, it's seen as an add-on. Uh, uh, basically, politicians play lip service to it. Um, it's sort of seen as a, as a soft option. Uh, now, why that would be the case when, in fact, the ultimate soft option is the semi-corrupt financial services industry is really hard to understand. But, you know, David, um, at least here in Denmark, you can hear politicians argue that, look, what our students need is to learn 
mathematics, they need to learn Danish, that is, they need to learn how to read and write. Uh, and why would they bother, you know, learning to play the drum or make an ox out of clay or something like that? It is utterly superfluous. We don't need that for our highly developed, how, um, uh, highly digitalized world. Uh, how, how do you um, respond to such an argument? I, I think that argument only holds good if you assume that none of us are interested in being rounded human beings. If you're not interested, it's like being a two-dimensional human. What you're suggesting is that human beings are two-dimensional. I don't think human beings are two-dimensional. I think human beings are three-dimensional. And if you remove the arts or the aspiration that, let, that tends toward the arts from us, we are utterly two-dimensional. Why is it that as, a, as an, an elderly person now, I can go to the opera at this point in my life and feel as though it's telling me about life? So what, what the opera does is tells me about life. Whereas when I was a kid, I, would, and, and I knew everything really about uh, pop music. I, I went to the movies. Those are the things that told me about life. I didn't learn life from, frankly, from, from life. I learned how to navigate life, from, in my case, from the movies uh, or from television. Now, why on earth would a, any politician worth, you know, with, 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 with a brain wish to have a two-dimensional society when in fact, with a little bit more effort, they actually could create three-dimensional societies. Wow. David, do you think you could move to Denmark and run for parliament? Then I could vote for you. <laughs> I like Denmark very, very much. I think maybe, and I mean this with all sincerity, I think Denmark may be the most civilised country in the world. I mean, I am a huge admirer. I'm a big admirer of Finland as well. I think that uh, there is something about the, about the balance of life within Scandinavia which could teach the rest of us, most particularly the United States and the UK, a very great deal indeed. So no, I think you're one of the luckiest men in the world to live in one of the nicest countries in the world. Oh, that's very kindly put. Um, you, you've already touched on this, but just to, um, to emphasise it a little more, what, uh, you know, as a society, what do we stand to gain, do you think, from placing emphasis on teaching the creative subjects? Again, going back to the argument that is, um, produced by certain politicians that we uh, we cannot afford it, especially in these COVID times when we need to slim down our budgets, uh, spending money, spending time and allocating resources for the creative subjects is seen as a bit of a luxury. So what do we stand to gain? Well, I think most important that we, st we all stand to gain is that if I project forward, and I don't I don't expect to be around, but if I project forward 15 years, the biggest single issue that everyone's going to face, doesn't matter what country you live in, will be climate change. That will mean diminished lives. I make no bones about this. It will mean people's lives will be diminished. It will mean they'll look for things that will give their lives purpose. And frankly, I'm not sure that mathematics and, uh, and, 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 and well, science can, of course, make a huge difference. Huge, and I happen to think science is an incredibly creative uh, uh, of, uh, art form in, in every way. It's no accident that Einstein was a, a very accomplished violinist as well as being a pretty accomplished scientist. So I don't, I don't agree there's any form of dichotomy. What I do feel is that in a post-climate change environment, when people's lives are going to be diminished, to have an understanding of, an engagement with, and an ability with the arts might just be as life-saving as the ability to cook. And I mean that, or grow food. You know, we're going to have to learn some pretty interesting fundamentals if we're going to navigate the next 20 years. And amongst those fundamentals is if you can play an instrument, you might just keep yourself sane. David, these days there's a lot of talk about democracy eroding and that the current generation of students and perhaps the generation um, following are threatened with a lack of democracy, that there is a lack of trust a lack of um, trust due to the digital platforms, etc. You know, facts not always being facts, uh, all things being thrown up into the air. Is that just some sort of uh, pessimistic outlook, or do you um, do you think there is a truth to it? No, I'm I'm actually worried sick about the impact on younger people of of the of the binary. Uh, the effect of social media. Very, very worried. I did a report for the government. I worked on it for a year and a half. And I was originally going to call it the restoration of trust. 
In the end, I called it the resurrection of trust because I felt the situation was so bad that it literally required a resurrection, not just a restoration. We're, we are not, we are not in a good place uh, at all. And I think for the, for young people, one of the most important things, almost more important than anything else is learning them, learning to develop trusted sources for them. Where do they get the source of their information? Are they taught to check and double check and not go down rabbit holes where, where their, where their opinion is all that matters? Could bear in mind for democracy to work, democracy is about compromise. It's about listening to other people. It's about not getting your own way all the time. It's about finding a way through complexity. Unfortunately, what we what social media does is it tries to give the impression of a world which is binary, black and white, where you where it's about you. It's about you and your views, and anyone that doesn't share your views is in a sense the enemy. You can't run a democracy, as we know it certainly, on that basis. So young people, in order to become Democrats, first of all have to learn uh, that it involves listening, secondly it involves compromise, thirdly it involves trust. Take those three pillars away and you're in every kind of trouble. And how do we resurrect those three pillars or how do we make sure that they stand where they should be? Who's, whose responsibility is this? It's, it's central governments and that's why in a way politicians have got to be very, very careful about how they treat opposition. You know, I was brought up in the UK where we have this phrase, uh, you know, Her Majesty's loyal opposition. The, 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 the position being that the opposition are as loyal to what's good in the long run for the UK as the, as the government of the day. Uh, and that at some point they're likely to change. And that, that change is, 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 is intended to reinvigorate democracy, not to deny it, not to deny it or, or despoil it. Uh, and that's a really fundamental component of a democratic system. Once you've got a single party or an over-dominant single party, democracy only gets eroded and eventually gets destroyed. Democracy by its very nature is fragile. And all of us as Democrats really should treat democracy like, treat it like, like carrying a glass bowl across a slippery floor during our lifetimes. The floor is slippery and the bowl is fragile. And we're gonna get that bowl from one side of the room to the other. And that's our life's journey. And if we fail with that, we slide down, the bowl smashes, and we have to start again. And that starting again and very, very painful. People die when you start again. And you're seeing it this week in in in, in, in Miramar. Uh, you're seeing it in many, many parts of the world where democracy is collapsing. As a net result, people are dying. And you were brought up during, during the war so you know about this. I know your father was away. You didn't see him until you were probably four or five years old. So you belong to a generation uh, which has that very, uh, you could say, uh, haunting experience. Uh, but today's youth, people who are, you know, the age of my children, they are teenagers, uh, they don't know about these, um, you, you could say, uh, almost apocalyptic scenarios. They just think that they can walk around with this uh, fishbowl without anything happening. Uh, so. My question is, David, how do you think we, we prepare them for, for the worst possible outcome? How, how do we make today's youth aware that democracy is something which should not be treated lightheartedly? Well, I was brought up with a very simple uh, rubric, which is those, those, who forget, those who forget their history are forced to relive it. So, I mean, what it really does need is that uh, today's young people have got to be, in a way, taken through the same experiences which was second nature to me, because I might, as you say, my dad was away in the war, uh, to, not, to not take yourself through that and understand the ramifications, implications of that, uh, you just, you, you become a very dumb person. Don't understand how, for example, Donald Trump, who I, have nothing, who I despise, was the idea that, that, that Trump was basically operating, certainly in the last three years of his presidency, what is essentially a fascist playbook. There's nothing new about it. It's a, it's a playbook. Uh, you could write, you could write it out. This happens, then that happens, and then that happens, and then that happens. And I say, in the end, what happens is the removal of freedom, and freedom is always removed by parties that call themselves the Freedom Party. Most extraordinary thing: the more parties talk about freedom, the more likely they are to remove it. Uh, it's, it's it's quite extraordinary. So yeah, I, I mentioned Miss Kirkpatrick, who taught me history. God bless her. She would she would turn in a grave if she understood how little today's young people know about the history that's formed them. 
And David, just to round us off, uh, you said that you worry sick about this development. What would it take? Uh, what do you think are the perspectives for you and other people like you, myself included, by the way, who are worried about the current situation, uh, to be less worrisome? I mean, how do we... You talk about uh, resurrecting three pillars, uh, but how, how do we get to that step? Because it seems to be uh, like we're up against some sort of... Uh, um, tsunami of, of stupidity and, uh, and, and lack of uh, understanding of history. The thing is, how do we challenge that? Well, we, I think there's two things. I'm not sure. I, I, don't, I can't answer the question because I'm not sure. I, what I do think is, clearly the situation hasn't gone critical enough for us all to wake up. So something needs to happen. That's where I place a lot of faith, believe it or not, in climate change. If I was God and I was looking to wake us all up, I would have invented climate change because it cuts right across. I don't know how much money you got. It doesn't matter where you come from, what part of the world you come from. You're going to get hammered by it. So wake up and realize we have, this is not just a fragile democracy. It's a fragile planet. And the great thing to always remember is the planet will be fine. The, don't worry about the planet. That's not the problem. The problem is at, whether the planet will accommodate us for much longer because we're the problem. So getting young people to understand that we are a problem, that we've got to get our act together, or frankly, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, my great-great-grandchildren will have the most unutterably terrible lives. Unutterably terrible. Um, that's a reality. And my last few years of my life, last 20 years of my life, I've just been made a member of the House of Lords Climate Change Committee. Uh, will be devoted to try and, you know, blowing a horn, get a wake-up call. I don't reckon I've got better than a 20% chance of succeeding, but 20% is better than nothing. We'll take, we'll take that. David Lord Putnam, thank you very much for devoting your time. You've been really excellent. And uh, I think you have, um, you've delivered a few awakening calls for some of us at least. So thank you very much. It's a great, great pleasure, Adam. I thoroughly enjoyed it, honestly.